Herkese merhabalar. 22 Mart bu defa çok değerli bir konu ağırlıyor olacağız. Lev Manoviç. Kendisi beni kırmadı geldi. Teşekkür ediyorum kendisine. Bundan sonraki aslında konuşmalarımız İngilizce olarak devam edecek. I would like to welcome Uh, my guest, uh, Lev Manovich. I'm grateful that he accepted my actually uh, lecture um, for the, um, it is yeah. my lecture series for museum studies, but Lev's study yeah. actually uh, links with the future uh, museology. So uh, we will listen uh, his uh, experience, especially Uh, I am going through his publications uh, during my um, classes and my lectures, uh, especially his uh, last couple of books and articles uh, on aesthetics. Uh, so um, I would like to now uh, give the word to Lev. And Lev, could you please talk about yourself briefly and then the screen will be yours. Yeah. Great. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I know that you probably don't want to think about it, but I just want to tell you that, you know, outside of Turkey, we are very much aware about the very awful events, right? The earthquakes, which took place recently. We understand what a tragedy it is for the whole country. Um, so, you know, we're remembering it. Um, and, um, uh, I hope at least I can distract you with some something entertaining for the next 45 minutes. Um, so before I um, uh, share the screen, uh, let me yeah, just explain a little bit about who I am and why I'll be doing what I'll be doing today. So I was born um, in Moscow, Russia, and grew up in the 60s and 70s, uh, immigrating to America in 1981. Right, so my intellectual and artistic kind of growth and development took place right in the late um, kind of communist society, where the only form of art which was officially allowed was political art. Right, so art was supposed to help in building communism. So art was political by default, uh, and even though practically none of contemporary or 20th century Western art was available. Right. I was able to see some things, and I developed a kind of great love for uh, so-called modernism, right? Because during 20th century, especially in the second part of 20th century, billions of people right, lived in the kind of communist societies uh, where these societies wanted to control people's mind. I mean, we also have an example of, of course, Hitler Germany, which also hated modern art. Uh, For, for different reasons. So for me, um, you know, I have a certain aversion, right? A certain, you know, personal difficulty with uh, the recent shift to uh, popularity of art, which I'm supposed to address social issues. I don't mind, but uh, the social issues are not my social issues. And, uh, you know, I'm, I like the 20th century idea that art can provide something different, right? unique experiences that can talk to us in unique languages, which involve all our senses. And as an artist, you know, I don't have to try to make a world better or worse. I can simply reflect how it is. And uh, I think human psychology, so-called human condition didn't change between now and 2000 years ago. Uh, but at the same time, having said that, uh, I will be showing you examples of my recent artworks mostly created using AI tools, which emerged uh, last summer, and they continue to develop. So some of them do address you know, political social issues, which are important to me, you know, such as the you know, Russian invasion in Ukraine. Uh, but I try to do it in a way where the artistic form, right, the aesthetics uh, is as important as the content and uh, not to do art, which simply illustrates fashionable progressive keywords. Um, now, I was trained to be an artist since the age of 12. Uh, 
I studied, you know, and then I also went to special high school in Moscow, where in addition to all the other subjects, I had, a, I had 20 hours. You have your others. I'm oh, sorry. Somebody, I'm somebody talking and I'm hearing it. Somebody talking and I'm hearing it. But you're somebody is talking. Okay, yeah, yeah. I, I was a bit young, kind of calculus and programming since the age of fifteen. When I studied architecture, uh, when I immigrated to America, went to New York University Film School, and then started to work with a very early computer media, three D computer animation, in as early as eighty four. Um, was a PhD student in cognitive science, got a master's, and then eventually got a PhD in visual culture. And um, from 92 to 2012, for 20 years, uh, I was teaching digital art, right, in various programs. Um, and it was very strange, right, because I was hired to be a digital artist, and I was most of my classes were art classes. But uh, because that field at the time had already many artists, but almost nobody writing about it, once I started writing about it, you know, I think the artists kind of want me to continue. So I became known as a writer and my own art practice, you know, I kind of put it, you know, I made it secondary, uh, but after doing it for years and also seeing the development of, right, you know, GPT-3 and now 4 and other tools, which at this moment can't really think like I am, we can't write like I am, but they're very, very useful, but maybe one day we will be, I said, you know, maybe... Guys, I'm sorry. Was I was I muted for a long time? Full time? No, just for a moment. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I thought. Okay. Maybe I don't need have to write books and articles anymore because you know uh, this uh, digital culture is now moving very fast, right? Today, Adobe announced a new major tool called Adobe Firefly, which looks like a good competitor to Midjourney, Stable Diffusion, and Dali Two. So instead of writing books and articles. Uh, which is sort of painful to me because English is not my first language. What I started to do last summer is post kind of images uh, on social networks, uh, mostly my images. So sometimes they're my, my artwork, sometimes they're images which are used as illustrations. Even sometimes I would just kind of post my artworks, right? And then other times I would uh, accompany these artworks by little theoretical notes, right, about AI. So if you want to see kind of my most recent thinking uh, for the last uh, almost, well, not a year, but nine months, go to Facebook, social media, LinkedIn, and Twitter, and don't go to my website because I haven't had time to turn all those notes into book pages. Okay, so let me share the screen. Okay, you have to enable screen sharing. I can't share the screen. You have to enable sh sh screen sharing for me. It's next to next to my it's next to the button next to my face. Yeah, you have to click yes. it. Yeah. Okay. Let's try. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. So um, yeah. So this is um, so I'm now just right started to put together all these notes from Facebook. Uh, so you see, I have like about twenty three different notes, and I hope to publish from as a, maybe a couple of chapters online in a few weeks uh, so i'm just working on today and um, i'm using one of many uh, uh, ai tools to uh, help me edit uh, which i highly recommend which is uh, quillboard okay? uh, because that's the example of like another kind of ai revolution which is not as dramatic as you know gpt4 or midjourney but you know it's actually made a big difference in my writing Right, because I can take you know any paragraph right, and put it here, and then um, ask AI to paraphrase it. And uh, you know, most of the time, what it what it does is better, right? Better, more grammatical, better styled, more clear than my own output. And you know, if I don't like it, I can kind of put a different word here, and I can also try different styles. So um, to me, it's an example of this broad, right, broad AI revolution, which um, sometimes becomes more meaningful when uh, AI is starting to do something we uniquely associate with human 
um, cognition and human creativity, right? Like when AI is writing text from scratch or making images, but for example, this ability to help me edit text is actually as revolutionary and perhaps even more important uh, because so far, you know, like if I try, right, chat GPT, it can't be right, it can't think like I, like I am, but it helped me to express my ideas better. Um, so as I said, you know, these developments are happening uh, quite quickly. This is just from today, right? This, this video was uploaded 16 hours ago. So Adobe, of course, which was a bit behind in these developments, uh, released a new tool, uh, which seems like it does everything else you know, our programs can do, but also seems to offer some innovations. Uh, for example, you can also generate new brushes, new textures, which is very interesting, right? So it's like a tool which allows you to generate new tools, like a kind of method tool, right? And, uh, you know, you can watch this video for yourself. So there are other things it can do. Okay? And finally, uh, before actually starting my presentation, as I said, uh, if you want to, you know, follow and my writing, right? Don't go to my website, just follow uh, my, you know, any of my social media. And, uh, you know, as I said, sometimes you have images, but sometimes there are theoretical notes and uh, maybe later I'll publish it as a kind of PDF, which will have images and books together, right? So here, for example, I'm talking about from representation to prediction, yeah, images in media history. And I don't say, Here's my idea, and I'm going to write an article, right? Because I'm like not patient. I'm just saying I can write an article, you know. And then in the future, somebody can take the skeleton and maybe put it in the AI tool, and the AI tool will write the article. Hopefully, more or less, you know, uh, what I wanted, or maybe it will write something else, right? So I find that kind of, you know, writing in real time, uh, having this tension that I'm going to post it, and people are going to see it, and then be able to come back to this post and refine it. This is my way to deal with writer blocks, which I will have like everybody else, uh, and uh, kind of going back and forth between images and text. Okay. Okay. Um, so here we are. Okay. So let me um, uh, show you the selection, right, of my uh, recent, I call them image series, uh, made the AI. And since uh, you know, the lecture title was AI is a memory machine. I'm going to specifically you know, talk about what I see as this very important function for artists, you know, filmmakers, designers, architects, and creators, but also very important new ability of AI for uh, everybody, right? So, for example, you know, if I want to recall how my bedroom looked when I was growing up in Moscow, right? Perhaps I can describe it using text prompt, and perhaps AI will generate more or less accurate picture of my bedroom. But of course, we realize right away that it's not gonna be so easy because if I grew up in New York or Paris or Berlin, right? Instead of Moscow, there are way more uh, media materials, you know, photographs, you know, TV programs, text, uh, which are online from the Western centers. And there are not that many informal photographs or other media recordings which remain, let's say, from Moscow in the 70s. Uh, and uh, when, I, when I write, when I repeatedly try uh, to use mid-journey, different, you know, different kind of versions of mid-journey and also stable diffusion, uh, what I get is sometimes it captures something about my memory of how I remember my life in Moscow in the 70s. Other times it becomes very generic, other times it always like puts images of churches and Kremlin, and it's not a linear development, right? So it's not like every version of the journey is getting better and better and more precise, right? Some versions kind of, in a way, have this much stronger kind of default language and default semantic universe. So they impose their own meanings and their own references. Other versions are more accurate. And I have to you know, relearn the language of prompting, how to prompt the computer. So it's kind of fascinating development. And um, what I noticed is that, of course, whether something you know, can be generated, synthesized by AI, does depend whether the something is present online and became part of a data set, right, which is used to train AIs, 
Like for example, until recently, right, people complained that many human figures generated in the journey had like deformed hands. And then we found out that there are not enough images of hands online. Uh, but I'm talking about right a more like fine-tuned, right, a more specific subjects, such as you know, how did Moscow look, for example, in the 70s, or something, or how did particular city, particular streets in a particular city in Turkey, right? Looked, uh, I don't know, in 1860s, right? So how much, so will, so people, museums, you know, creators, governments you know, will be tempted to use AI as a new memory machine, right? The way we use you know, images and video and 3D simulations. And uh, we have to be very careful both as individual creators and the society because uh, what we may get instead is not real memories, it's not a kind of uh, machine travel into the past, but the kind of implanted memories, right? It's simulated memories, which tend to substitute very unique things by very generic things. Let me show you examples right, right away. Uh, so, uh, sorry, sometimes when I use this room, the internet is a bit slow. Okay, here we go, right? Okay. So, okay, so, so this is, you know, start with very literal examples when I talk about maybe more, you know, let's say more interesting examples. So this was uh, one of my attempts, right, to recreate uh, with feeling, right, my memories of being in school in Moscow in the 70s. And this was done, I think, around September, or October 2022. So this is early version of the journey. I think it's version three. And, uh, while many of these faces, right, have these anatomical distortions, I, I, when I look at them, I don't notice because there are certain kind of deeper things, deeper structures, deeper patterns in this image. Maybe it's the color, maybe it's you know the, the you know the hair, maybe it's other things. I don't quite know what we are, so it seems to capture really well my memory of you know 15, 16 year old, you know 17 year old being in Moscow in the mid-70s, even though there is not enough realism, right? Um, so this is you know, images from the same series, right? And uh, another thing you'll see in these tools, and it's kind of predictable, that sometimes these tools are better when a human artist or human designer, and they can generate infinite variety. And other times, like it's kind of the same person, right? Being repeated. Uh, which I find not terrifying, but kind of interesting, right? And uh, this is another image, and I made many images. So this is kind of mid journey, uh, what it was able to do in September and October, right? Uh, and then uh, around the same time, right? I tried a different tool uh, called uh, Stable Diffusion, right? And here, uh, uh, in the kind of right, the kind of version of Moscow, version of Russia from 1970s, which I get, it's a different one, right? And I can't say which one is more objective because of course our memory is also playing tricks on us, right? We remember things which never happened. Sometimes people in court report seeing some accident which never happened. Uh, and uh, maybe my memory of Russia is not, is, is, is already has been kind of filtered, right? And transformed by uh, wonderful films by people like Tarkovsky, right? So what I remember is not, let's say, Russia and Moscow, how it was in 1975, but how it was represented in the cinema. And there is obviously something very seductive about these images because this is not a real street photograph, right? This is really like, like almost a photograph or a theater play, right? Uh, where actors are performing, you know, being Russian teenagers in the 70s or even today, so, uh, and this is one of these kind of biases, which the software has, and I don't like to use the word bias, right? Because it's overused today. So it's not very, you know, not very maybe useful. Uh, people who run these companies, who make these tools, talk about default languages, right? So we see all the journey every time we test a new model says, well, they're going to get, you know, feedback from users. We have users rating images, you know, and then let's say by default, you know, uh, if you don't specify colors, the colors will be, you know, orange and, and green, which are the same colors often used in Hollywood and something else. But of course, with uh, default languages are not just visual languages, we also kind of semantic, right? So are we getting reality? Are we getting reality uh, as, 
it has been represented like in, in a popular cinema because there are lots of images right online. You know, it's open question. And again, I don't want to judge anybody, right? Because it's very dangerous to judge any technology because every time you publish a critical article, the technology already improved, right? So for me, these are interesting paradoxes. So for some people concerned of, let's say, social use of media, you know, these things are very troubling. For me, they're more like fascinating. And since I don't think we can reach some kind of correct memory anyway, I mean, let's remember, right? Proust novel, right? In search of lost memories. Uh, memory is always construction. So for me, these are interesting paradoxes. And the fact that I don't quite know what these tools are doing, but it's also stimulating, right? So let me show you. So what I've done here, right? So again, this is also last fall. And uh, with stable diffusion, was also making kind of lots of uh, anatomical mistakes. Well, in fact, you can see here, right, that these heads are not like in a proper perspective, where they kind of squash against each other. So when I took these images to Photoshop and I kind of, you know, uh, darken some areas, uh, uh, which, you know, and, you know, and also kind of also added some fog, some mist, uh, which I kind of like. And again, when I look at them, right, I don't even notice with anatomical problems because I think I project all kinds of personal feelings, uh, my own cognitive filters, but for ours, this is very important, right? Um, so let's continue, right? So this is from Midjourney version four. So I think this was done maybe around November, December. And obviously you can see how realism, right? The level of detail and spatial coherence has improved. Although there is still right, something kind of strange happening here. In reality, like, right, this woman face probably would be a bit smaller because it's going to be behind this old guy. But uh, uh, that's what we get. So is it better or is it worse than the previous results? It depends, right? We obviously have more realism. They're more visually interesting. than something which photographers would call a money shot, right? And uh, I have also worked a lot in Photoshop to kind of refine these images to add this kind of bluish tint. In fact, I made them more cinematic. And uh, so then the question arises, right? Do these images obviously do not correspond to any real photograph, which would be taken, in fact, anywhere, right? Uh, they are too condensed, right? Every, every face is like a type. Uh, and uh, why these people are standing and they're sleeping, it's also unclear. So on the one hand, we capture something, but what we capture, it's a bit difficult, right, to put the words. Um, and uh, uh, in the same time, as I said, right, by kind of more theatrical, it's in fact, uh, Midjourney, which, you know, often thought is the best platform uh, for this AI image generation, has a parameter, right, called uh, S, stylized, which uh, in the current version goes from zero to thousand. So if you put it to larger number, we default to the hundred, you get an image which is sort of more, you know, more beautiful, more maybe baroque in the strong contrast between light and dark areas. So it's visually more stunning, but it also tends to be more stereotypical, right? So I don't remember like what parameter I used for the series, but I probably used something like, you know, something like, 300, right? Whereas uh, if I would, you know, put this parameter to zero, I make it something where the faces are more realistic. They're not as exaggerated. They're not as, so they're not as archetypes, but the image itself is less beautiful. So which is, you know, each of these images took hours of like fine tuning in Photoshop, but I haven't tried it in version four. Um, okay, so let's continue, right? So the question becomes then, you know, so how do you deal with this fact, right? That uh, these tools have a very, have sometimes very strong, and sometimes very subtle, a kind of language, right? A message of its own. And also that very fidelity, right? Where the level of detail kind of changes from, you know, every few months. So um, what I realized is that, you know, if I spend lots of time making this very precise kind of photorealistic images, Right, as you saw, these images, you know, this is again a few months ago, you know, they're you know, they're nice, but but maybe already today you can make better ones in mid journey five. So, when you wonder why did I spend your know, months, you know, hours and hours, you know, trying to fine tune them, 
to hide various problems, whereas today the new version of the tool is going to make them better automatically. So, uh, so kind of both consciously and maybe unconsciously, thinking about my early art, the kind of you know, drawings, you know, watercolor paintings, oil paintings, and so on that I was doing in my late teens and my 20s, I said, you know, maybe I will choose a different aesthetics as opposed to trying to make images, right? Which can use the tool uh, at, at, uh, you know, at its best, which of course tomorrow will be not the best anymore, which is trying to make these photorealistic photographs. I will try to make something else, which is more painterly, a bit more abstract, because after all, right, today we can look at drawings of Dürer or Rembrandt or Rubens and they look totally contemporary, right? So why we look at, you know, uh, while with media, something about modern media, which doesn't work, right? So if we look at, uh, you know, digital images from the 90s, we have too low resolution. Even if we look at our uh, mobile, mobile camera images from five years ago, right? Way too blurry. Uh, it's hard to look. It's kind of impossible to look at any media from the 90s because even technically it did not survive, right? All this interactivity. It's hard today to look and enjoy silent black and white films, but with something about media, which is not as kind of photorealistic, media which is a bit more abstract, media which is not trying to be as detailed, which survives well. So, um, so I tried to start to make these images, which also partly right connect to my kind of feelings, which I value both in modern art, but also feelings, you know, which remind me a bit of my childhood. So maybe it's Russia because it's a winter, but it doesn't have to be Russia. It can be also something else. And uh, there are certain archetypical signs, which I see a lot in kind of Russian films and also Russian artworks about this time, which is snow fields and te telegraph poles, electricity poles and wires, it kind of minimal landscape. But what I also did, I would specify in my text prompts, as opposed to like, 35 meter photograph or a word meaning photograph in my prompt, I would say architectural diorama. And I would also put things like fog and mist, right? So before I didn't tell people what prompts I use. So now, okay, now I'm kind of giving it away. So uh, of course this diorama can also probably look better in version five or version six or version seven, but because I am not trying to be like realistic, I'm actually trying to be a bit more minimal. I'm leaving more things for a viewer to imagine and to fill in Right, cognitively, I mean, I look at these images, you know, right, uh, three, four months later, and to me, we still look very satisfying, right? Uh, because again, we're not trying to use the tool at its kind of maximum capacity, because I think one of the problems with uh, kind of so-called new media is whenever like a new tool comes out, like a new version of VR, a new version of XR, or some kind of 360 degree projection, people like rush to use this new capacity, and after a few years, it just looks embarrassing. You don't want to look at it again. Whereas looking at the drawings or paintings from 500, or even 30,000 years ago works because what we enjoy in fact is the difference. And again, I'm not saying that my works will have a test of time, right? I'm talking about my ideal and my understanding. So yeah, it helps me to understand our history a bit differently, right? So normally we think about 20th century kind of modernism and modern contemporary art as uh, having this dialogue between reality, three-dimensional world, as we normally see it, and let's say more abstract, more minimal, uh, uh, uh, a kind of different representation, right? So you know, you don't draw a face in every detail like a photograph, but you represent the face by one line. And this difference between how a face looks to our brain and the drawing is what creates this distance, and this distance can allow us this artworks to survive, right? So again, maybe I'll look at this six months from now, it will look ridiculous. But for me, these images, you know, like I look at them, right, from a few months distance, and I like them, right? Um, so some of them are more political than others, uh, but often these political images come out also as, a, you know, kind of, you know, randomly, right? So every media, every art tool has its own form of randomness, right? When you paint, with oil paint, there's one randomness, when you draw, and I think maybe what's most interesting about AI today, you know, not only that you can command it and control it to do amazing things, but that it has its own forms of accidents. So this image, right? So often AI misunderstands my prompts 
So this image came out, right, as a result of accident. And I think it's my maybe most political image. So of course, in the back of my mind, like so many people are thinking about the war, right, in Ukraine and all the sufferings, uh, both, you know, Ukrainian people, but also all the intellectuals, kind of thinking people, my students in Russia, right? Well, Putin, you know, in one moment destroyed, you know, this new progressive Russia kind of European culture, which was, you know, developing in the last 30 years. And most of my friends have already immigrated, but some are still continuing to do exhibitions of Russia and trying to have a, some kind of you know, illusion of cultural life, right? So, you know, and as you know, of course, it's obvious with the older people and also people who live outside the big cities, you know, right? In Russia, we get great news from TV and mass media. Mass media is kind of, kind of more or less controlled by Kremlin. And that's why you get the survey results where like 70 or 60% of Russians support Putin. Uh, first of all, we'll never tell you something different because of course, nobody will tell you honestly, but we may actually, uh, which is very strange to us, support whatever Putin says because we get renews not from internet, but from television, right? So I was trying to like think about how to represent it. And I don't want to be very literal. Even this image came out where it was all the couple is actually inside the TV set. So, uh, and there are also the strange animals, right? Uh, so some other images, you know, again, trying to uh, maybe deal with some aspects of kind of Soviet communist aesthetics, which surround me when I grew up, right? Where, uh, you know, this late kind of Brezhnev, right? Uh, so-called communist country, everything was not developing, everything was not dynamic, everything was kind of static. So it's almost like this late Greek or Roman world, right? Everything is frozen and kind of idealized. Uh, and again, right, I kind of, I kind of, so obviously um, I'm trying to figure out like how many other people, and that's not only applies to Russia, how to deal with the past of your particular country, right? Where on paper, Right, uh, you know, the Russian society was terrible, and of course, communism was the worst thing which happened to humanity. Right? I mean, hundreds of millions of people were killed in communist Russia, in communist China, etc., more than anybody else. But at the same time, it was a place where I grew up. It was a place where I had my first love, my first sex. It's a place where I learned about art. Right? So I have this very complex relationship to this place, and uh, and I think you know many of these images are more nostalgic. Uh, I don't think there's any kind of hate in them. Uh, and uh, uh, I guess the last thing I will say, uh, so, um, sorry, there's a delay between the click on something. Right? Uh, so already when I was uh, in Russia, like in my 18, 19, right, I started to make these little sculptures where I would represent these fragments. So maybe I was almost anticipating a future immigration. I immigrated when I was 21. And that was a huge psychological trauma, which I'm still recovering, right? So I've uh, been now in therapy with amazing Russian psychologists for the last three years, I'm working on Zoom, you know, and there's still things to work out uh, because this immigration, which I thought would be the beginning of new life, it was, it opened all kinds of perspective, but it was also for my family, you know, a huge trauma. Uh, and for many years after immigrating, I kind of felt that you know, the ground disappeared under my feet and I'm kind of floating and my old world was kind of, right, you know, the comfortable world of my parents, my apartment, you know, my friends. I kind of psychologically got blown up to pieces. So I, so I kind of recently, I came back to this image and then it turns out, right, but if I kind of play with prompt and use different tricks and basically almost kind of force my journey to misunderstand me, right? Uh, I kind of force it to make mistakes. It's actually very good at representing this particular atmosphere, this feeling of fragments. And again, to avoid to avoid this effect, where I try to make something very really realistic, photorealistic, even a few months from now, it will look terrible. Uh, I'm putting uh, things on my prompts, like architectural panorama or diorama, or photograph of panorama, right? To kind of decrease this level of realism, uh, and to create, right, a bit more ambiguity to have a viewer kind of fill in, right, uh, details, and hopefully these images will be still interesting to me. And I guess uh, before we open up to questions, uh, I want to kind of go back in a way <laughs> and show you a couple of images, the kind of drawings I was doing uh, when I was 18, 19. So this is where I came from. So 
So now after you know almost right, 45 years, I'm going back, I'm teaching myself again how to draw, and I'm having this constant dialogue with AI tools, which both can help me to understand what is unique about kind of human art making, what is unique about manual drawing, even, even if you use iPad. And uh, kind of in this going back and forth between traditional so-called tools, which you know, which I'm good at because at least I was good at in the latest tools, is I think very good. And I really think with new media artists who actually don't know anything besides new media are just complete fools and nobody will remember the art by tomorrow, right? So uh, let me just say, uh, just show you a couple of things. Uh, just a moment. Again, there is this delay, I apologize. Um, so this is my drawings when I was 21, 22, right? Representing this imaginary kind of Russia as this symbolic world and a kind of theater where everybody performs, right? Because you are in this communist society, everybody has to say certain things. Only among friends, you can tell the truth. Uh, so this is just pen on paper. Again, I'm 22, 23. Come on. Sorry, it's getting stuck. Um, okay, I hope. Just want to actually show you one image. Uh, let me just see if it's uh, okay. Maybe not this one. Okay, let me just and then we can open for questions because right because I was asked to not speak about 30, 45 minutes. Um, yeah, so uh, there's lots here, but I'll just show you one. Um, so this is kind of where I started. Um, so this is a portrait of my mother, right? I drew, you know, she was sitting for me. I was 18. Uh, so this is a technical pen on tracing paper, right? And, uh, right, we can zoom in. And uh, you can see that I'm kind of creating everything, right? In a way, in a very modernist way, right? I'm trying not to put the objects in this Cartesian space, but the objects, you know, the shape emerges out of a space, it's like a density of the same space, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, I can't draw it like this now, but I hope in six or eight months I'll be able to do it. And then, you know, I'll be able, I want to actually draw portraits of people who are closest to me today, like artists used to do, right? Not just to deal with some abstract keywords and abstract ideas, which are not my ideas. Right? I want to draw my life, but do you see that there is a kind of stem here? So what it is is that, you know, this is, I think, a little story I want to end. You know, when we uh, finally were kind of given permission, right, to immigrate, uh, like I only decided to take about 35 to 40 of my artworks out of thousands I made. I was very productive as a child and teenager. And um, uh, I had to take them to like the Ministry of Culture or some other official agency and was this young art historian. And she looked at all the works. And uh, but a couple, of, and that's why all works I was able to take and have a stamp, meaning it's allowed. But for a couple of images, which I said you can't take it because we don't represent social reality in the right way, and these images were just landscapes. So, this is how I learned that you don't have to do anti government images, you don't have to restrain ideologies and keywords to be political. That all governments, uh, or, more, or many governments, both in the 20th century and today, what we don't like. We don't like subtlety, we don't like nuance, we don't like melancholy, because we want people to be productive. And uh, that's why I feel that these kind of images I'm making, uh, the AI today, they are, from my point of view, very progressive and very political, because they're simply different from what everybody else is doing with new media, right? Uh, again, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, maybe a year from now, I'll say this is terrible, but uh, this is what I'm doing. and. As my friend said, Lev, you know, it doesn't matter if it's good or not. It's simply different when, you know, when things which are associated with computers, VR, XR, 360 projections. Uh, and uh, ultimately, uh, one, I think, good output is with making these images, thinking about them also allows me, right, to think about AI and uh, think about it in the context of kind of history of media, history of art, modernism, and so on. Uh, so you get to read my notes and hopefully, you know, will be helpful to many people who use these tools. Uh, something which I was trying to do for the last 30 years, but this time I'm doing it while no longer trying to put my own art production behind me, right? In fact, 
I'm probably now spending more like 80% of my time making art and 20% writing. Uh, so far, people invited me to participate in already six online physical exhibitions uh, with these new images. And uh, I'm very excited that this October, I will have a big personal exhibition in the Art Center in Lisbon because I'm very interested in details and I want to see these images kind of printed. And as I said, right, I'm trying to uh, kind of teach myself how to draw again. Uh, it takes, you know, takes a while. Uh, but uh, let's see, this is a film drawing, which was a few weeks ago. I know if it opens up. It actually took me 68, 68 hours to do it because I was like just learning how to draw. But now it's going faster. And this is just done using iPad uh, and uh, Procreate. And now I'm working on the second drawing, which I call Adventures of a Cube or Cubism. So it's going to be hundreds of different versions of the simplest possible subject, which is a cube. And uh, well, yesterday I spent hours kind of giving these images an input to me journey version five and realized that at least for now, uh, these tools, maybe they can be trained, but out of out of the other box, we're just not able to, this is even more simple, right? But with this diversity, variability uh, and mistakes which I'm making, and it's just not something that I can do right now. I can do most amazing stuff. I can do amazing stuff, but it can't draw a picture of a cube like, like I see it. So this is where I'm going to end. And I hope we'll have some time for questions and discussions. Mm -hmm. You can also type uh, the questions into the chat. Uh, I will try to read them and answer. Thank you, Lev, for your great lecture. And uh, now I will ask guests uh, to ask you questions. But before that, uh, I'm fascinated uh, with your etchings in Russia and also yeah. the impact of your memory and how you transform uh, that whole actually experience to your art. Uh, it is uh, incredible and you are using new uh, digital tools actually uh, and you are creating images uh, with that background that you had uh, and you actually wrote your book also on aesthetics in 2019 mm -hmm. uh, which is available uh, online uh, and I send it to my students to uh, read. Yeah. And uh, now I will uh, let guests ask you questions, uh, then I will take over. Sorusu olanlar varsa, ben aslında kısaca, let me summarize your talk briefly. Oh, oh my God, oh my God. Okay, well, I will, okay, but I can also- No, uh, in want, five okay, minutes. Okay. Well, I wonder if you, okay, by the way, interesting. Okay, okay, because one of the things GPT is good for somebody, but, of course, my talk, I don't quite know what I'm talking about, right? Because I'm no longer this lab academic. I'm like in between these different worlds. So, but I think I think it made some sense. But for me, like I don't quite know like what I was actually saying. Like I can let I'm trying to let myself be a bit more free, you know. So I'm curious what it is you heard. So thank you in advance. Sorry, I will try my best and my okay. memory uh, in a way uh, to translate okay. what you were actually trying to tell. Then I will ask the questions. Uh, so um, you have mentioned actually about your memories uh, in Moscow. So bu aslında Levin hayatında çok uh, önemli bir yer uh, taşıyor. Özellikle göçe bağlı ailesini orada uh, bırakmış olup oh, Amerika'ya oh. uh, göç etmesi. Ama her zaman aslında uh, hayalinde orada yaşadığı uh, özellikle Karlı uh, öğleden sonra uh, insanlar uh, hep bir arada. E, posterde de ifade ettiği gibi belki gelecekte olan bir yaşamı e, vurgular gibi kendisi. Aslında e, tabii ki e, ilk gösterdiği imajlarda yeni teknolojileri kullanarak e, hafif puslu etkiler yapıyor. Bunu e, Photoshop'tan öte aslında yapay zeka becerisiyle e, değiştirdiğini, renklendirdiğini e, söyledi. 
E, ve e, insanlar üzerindeki baskılar, toplumsal e, politik olayların ve kültürel değişimlerin aslında ne kadar önemli olduğunu e, onun eserlerinde ve çağın eserlerinde aslında bundan bahsetti. E, ve bu imajlar ve bunlar üzerinde hafif manipülasyonlar yaparak aslında İmajın e, farklı şekilde e, kişilere aktarıldığında farklı düşünceleri e, doğuracağını da e, ifade etti. E, kendisi zaten yayınlarında e, ifade ediyor yapay zekayı nasıl kullandığını. E, ve bütün bu aslında e, dijital e, dünyanın e, yeni e, fırçaları diyelim. E, palet, belki iPad ama kullanılan programların e, hepsi de onun e, fırçaları. E, şöyle söyledi aslında kendisi. Dedi ki yani bugün e, herkes aynı tuğulları kullanıyor, aletleri ama herkes farklı bir şey üretiyor. E, ve kişi biriktirdikleriyle aslında e, üretiyor. E, bu da onu zaten e, çok farklı kılan e, bir de İpek'e söz vereceğim. E, İpek Yensu'ya. E, now I would like to ask. Okay, thank you. Ipek thank Yensu. you very much, uh, Lev. It's great to see you again. Uh, and uh, thanks everyone for their valuable questions too. Uh, I was wondering about uh, this critical line of thought about all kinds of new technologies that uh, emerge. It always follows like uh, this technology will enslave us or uh, yeah. it will just uh, submit sure. our creativity yeah. uh, to the uh, company's control, etc. The same kind of criticism is also yeah. here, uh, very vibrantly here uh, in terms of uh, AI and art. So what do you think about these issues? No, Would no. AI be uh, such a you know risky thing for uh, the creative uh, professionals? Yeah. Well, so thank you so much for your great question, which you, know, you already, of course, answered it. Um, so you're absolutely right. And I think there have been people already in the 90s in the kind of media theory field uh, who already pointed out that um, each time a new kind of media technology emerges a modern society, at least since the 19th century, at least since photography. Early, I don't know, but I think books also. There is a certain number of common ideas, common fears, common debates, which appear, even after a while, we just accept it, right? So for example, there is this kind of famous anecdote, uh, which comes from some book, don't ask me which book, where like a person says, you know, uh, okay, I, I entered the room and I saw, you know, a young person completely immersed in his activity. He didn't even notice me, but I was in the room, and that was terrifying. And this is somebody describing, you know, entering the room and seeing a person reading a book in the early 16th century. Uh, so I think, so I think the interesting question, and I actually have master's student who is still in Russia, but you know, hopefully will be able to live soon. <laughs> and I, I, who was trying to work on AI, I said, I think this is a good, so I think if you try to chase AI technology, by the time you finish a thesis, it will be outdated. But I think if you can work on the discourse, that's also easy to track because it's in the news. So I think the interesting question is not whether any of these ideas are true because we emerge always, but are there any ideas around this particular moment which are unique to this moment, right? Uh, so I think the ideas about copyright and technology cheating, that's probably not new. The idea about democratization is not new. The idea that you know, AI will put people out of a job is not new. And of course, it's wrong. Because, you know, let's say uh, when computer graphics appeared, right, and it became photorealistic, I mean, we still have photographers, but we also have millions of people now employed doing video games, 3D simulations, and so on, right? Uh, but... Uh, so none of these ideas is true, uh, but I think the interesting question, you know, are these the same ideas we just keep repeating over 200 years, or is there some change? And uh, I think I have to wait until my student writes her thesis because that's kind of her job, but perhaps you have some ideas about it, right? So that's to me, right? The question is not, is it all new, right? 
like which aspect of it is new, right? Uh, and I think the same thing we can, if we talk about actually what it does practically, right? Like generative media, uh, you know, uh, when I draw something which doesn't exist, right? But also in a way it was already like AI, right? AI can uh, visualize something which doesn't exist. And with photography, right? We go in different direction where we can only photograph something which exists, right? So in a way it's like when I certain modalities, which just kind of in different technologies, including kind of drawing, which is kind of human technology, uh, fill in, right? So that's, so I think, so it's not about like, I mean, I guess, you know, I don't want to reduce all discussion to what's new about new media because it, it's a bit like, right? Like old, old style. Uh, and that's why I think I'm kind of going back and forth in my own work between using these tools and drawing. And, um, but maybe I can't escape this kind of line. But I think we have to invent new ways to think about new media, which is not always comparing it, right? Anyway, sorry, I kind of started to ask a question which I can't answer. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so it, much. Yeah. Uh, I think reflecting on these issues uh, critically from different directions is very useful. So uh, I just wanted to take this opportunity sure. uh, to ask you about it. Thank you so much. Yeah, and maybe I can just add briefly, right? Because uh, one of the questions which is often asked, and that was the first question which somebody typed into our, you know, into our chat, was what do you think about this kind of copyright debate because AI is stealing from artists? And um, I gave like a very you know obvious answer where, you know, uh, in our culture, right? Most people, even culture professionals, for some reason have this romantic idea of artist, creator, who can create from scratch, right? Whereas I think, you know, a more accurate perspective, and it's not only perspective of people like Roland Barthes or Foucault, it's kind of common sense perspective. You know, everybody copies, right? We go through life, we see things. Uh, sometimes, you know, we copy something directly. Sometimes we copy something indirectly. And both fine arts and commercial art and all creative industry works like this. And in fact, you know, I think that uh, with AI, right, people actually made investigation. We found out that only maybe 4% of the time, this uh, mid-journey kind of type of tools copied something directly from some image. So we actually do something synthetic. So from a kind of a precise point of view, these tools are less guilty of copying than we are, you know? So if you want to blame them, we should blame ourselves first, because as you know, the only field where you have to clear the copyright is, is music, right? Music samples, right? So, uh, so you know, so, but I think it's very easy to blame AI for all kinds of problems in society, whereas the problems can start with us, right? Uh, so. And the fact that, you know, the, the, let's say the digital media has been around for 30 years, and obviously the copyright law is kind of behind, right? So. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, there's a question in the chat, but you know. Uh, Daphne Boskurt would like to ask you a question. Uh, Buyurun, Daphne. Yes, hello. Hi. I was just trying to write my question in chat, but I think okay. it's better this way. Thank you for oh, giving yeah. me a chance. Um, thank you very much for your beautiful, for your very graceful uh, presentation and your work. <laughs> um, okay. So I, I, wa I want to make one uh, comment and then a question. Um, uh, your work reminded me uh, a little bit of the, the uh, Japanese landscape architect uh, Junya Ishigami is work, especially during the time of in 2008, the Venice Architecture Biennale, uh, there was something very um, similar in, in, in feeling. So I just putting it out there, maybe it interests Thank you, you, I don't know. Maybe, uh, you can, maybe you can send me because I'm, I'm not sure I know it. Maybe you can like, yeah. or maybe yeah. you can send me because I would like to take a look, yeah. I'm, okay. sure, I'm sure I'm cutting somebody who I actually haven't seen, but I'm cutting this person anyway. That's how it works. <laughs> Yeah, but I will anyway. write his name in the chat. I write it Thank now so in the much. chat. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, so I sent it. Great, uh, the, great. the question oh, I have, what I find really yeah. intriguing uh, is the fact that, uh, you know, despite everything that, that the mid journey opens up for you, or maybe because of that, it's yeah. your your uh, thoughts on that maybe, um, the, the, the fact that you have the impulse and desire somehow to go back to the sort of physical and bodily 
uh, application uh, or production of your art uh, that, that, mm -hmm. that you that you that you go back and forth perhaps or however that interaction is that finding I find it very interesting because it's it's almost like this anthropological embodiment of, of uh, right. like a ritual of making it and which otherwise would get lost yes. somehow so I find that very interesting I, yeah. I, I wonder what you have to say about yeah. that Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Well, I want to say one thing, right? Is that you know, like, like you know, like for thirty years, I was doing particular things, right? Kind of intuitively, but it was almost like a direction. I'm theorizing in media and now. Like, I keep doing it, but I also wanted, I kind of wanted to get off a strain and just see what else happens. So uh, I'm doing things which are intuitive. But but what I want to say is this, right? Is that uh, in fact this kind of this kind of going back and forth, right, between the latest computer tools and kind of hand drawing or hand or let's say graphic arts. It already happened to me before. Uh, because these images which I showed, right, with like surrealistic landscape, etc., uh, we were actually done not when I was living in Russia, we kind of done after I left Russia, because obviously we showed this kind of absurd surreal world, and I would never be allowed to take them out. Uh, and the most detailed images were done after 84. When I started to work, right, in one of the first computer, uh, one of the first companies, which was doing computer animation for effects. And the reason I, I turned my attention, right, to 3D computer graphics is I wanted to be a filmmaker, like more, many of us, but I was put off by, oh my God, I need budgets, there's hundreds of people, I'm shy, I have to direct them. Uh, but once I started working with this company in mid 80s, I realized that, you know, at that time, right, the computers were super slow, the algorithms didn't quite exist, and I remember it took me like it took computer eight hours just to render a sphere. Like only I think maybe five to ten years ago with you know with um, Unreal, Blender, etc., and powerful PCs, you can make very complex, detailed worlds. Uh, but it was not possible. So as a reaction, right, to what I experienced, I started to make drawings, right? Or rather, my drawings uh, became more and more detailed, right? Because I was trying to draw something which I wanted to do with computers, but I can't. Right. Uh, so I think what's happening today, I mean, there are obviously different reasons why I'm doing this drawing practice. Uh, one is that it's just incredibly relaxing. Right? It's something very peaceful, right? Uh, about making this, you know, this um, uh, lines and building the image in layers, uh, this kind of cube images, I kind of build them in layers. Uh, and uh, uh, so that's one reason. The second reason, right, when I make these beautiful images with my journey or our tools, they're amazing, but they don't feel mine, right? In other words, while I said that I don't care about copyright, I actually do feel like I'm stealing from not particular artists, but like I'm stealing from a whole, from a whole humanity history of art, right? So yesterday I made some very beautiful images which look like still lives by Chardon, and they're very satisfying. And I guess if I was you know, commercial illustrator, visual effects artist, that would be great. But uh, if I was artist, now let me be a romantic artist for a second and say, I kind of want to go back to something which is unique to me. And of course, this unique, it's not really truly unique because something I saw when I was 12 or 14, is something I picked up. But I kind of want to almost forget, right? 42 years of living in the West and being on the forefront of the media and being exposed to millions of images, and I said, so if, I, if I'm going to make art seriously, what shall I do? I thought, well, maybe I should just go back to what I was drawing when I was 12, 14, and 22. Maybe it's not, a, maybe it's not, right? Maybe it's not, maybe it's not a worse place to start. So there are multiple reasons why I'm doing it. But one thing which I want to highlight, as you said, it's a kind of physical process. It doesn't matter if you're drawing on hand or you're actually drawing an iPad or even Photoshop. It's tedious. It's very inefficient. So it's opposite, it's opposite, right, of making things with AI tools. And, you know, as you know, I'm kind of person who always likes, everybody does A, I want to do B. So exactly at the moment where everybody rushed to new media, you know, and all the museums, you know, MoMA, doing all the stuff, I'm like, okay, left. Finally, your moment has come, but it's too easy. So I have to, you know, do something opposite, and the opposite would be, you know, kind of drawing by hand and confusing everybody, right? But I do hope, but it made for a kind of interesting talk and you didn't guys all left after I finished. So I'm onto something. And um, 
where it's all going to go, I don't know exactly. And that's the beauty of it, right? Because so much of our society is predetermined and we know with AI tools will be getting better and better. And uh, I also think finally in a very pragmatic way that not many people in this new media art world have like drawing <laughs> training and drawing techniques. So maybe I can do something which would be a bit different from our people uh, because I would love to also show these things in exhibitions at large size. And uh, in a way, uh, finally, it's a kind of very psychological therapeutic journey, right? Uh, because I had this first part of my life in Russia before migrating, and then there's a second part. So I'm kind of trying to bring you know, these parts together. Like some of you, right, have lived through this awful earthquakes, right? Many of us had all kinds of experiences as child, as you know, young people, you know, and uh, my psychologist said to me, Lev, you know, the trauma never goes away. There is no such thing as getting rid of a trauma. We only think, okay, now I'm going to be psychologist for a second. She said, the only thing you can do is try to get some positive things out of this traumatic experience, right? So by kind of going back to this moment where my life was kind of broken into parts before and after immigration, you know, maybe I'm just trying to heal myself, but hopefully some interesting things for others will also come from this process. And, and thank you for allowing me to finally start talking about it because for you know 30 years I could never talk about my history, my parents, and my talk. It was simply too painful. And now I'm trying to do it. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll ask you a question. Do you plan to uh, actually um, load this experience, these whole artworks that you will present in Lisbon uh, as an NFT format? Uh, so, you know, uh, as, a, as somebody who is trying to be right on the edge and write about it, uh, I, I don't follow video games because it's such a huge world, but NFT, you know, when it started to become popular, yeah, I made, you know, I made some NFT images. I learned how to use processing like in one evening. I made some abstract images. I published them on OpenSea uh, in April 2021. We all got sold. Uh, we all one of his NFT art platforms where a curator is a very dear friend of mine. So she knows about art. We published some of my images. It was presented in Paris. Yeah, I already have an NFT experience, but uh, you know, I, I come from a particular tradition, right? Where as some of you know, I'm probably the only person who made his whole career from the internet, right? So in 93, I got my first teaching job after finishing PhD. This is when the web kind of right, started to become popular. Uh, and uh, I went home, I made website, and everything I ever written, I just put online, right? So when I write an article or I, I publish a book and I sign a contract, and when I go home and I put it online anyway, right? You can find all my books, including obviously my two books online. Uh, don't tell them. Uh, you could, uh, anyway, right? So, uh, so from images, right? I mean, everything I did since last July, which I think is interesting, I put it right into a, into a Instagram and Facebook, etc. So I'm open source just because I think it's easy, right? So when you deal with people, you know, like we, you know, we can things get sometimes difficult, right? Uh, and as far as NFT, you know, I'm a professor, right? In New York, I have very good salary because it's like America. I'm a professor of computer science, it just so happens. So I don't need to make more money from NFT. What I'm more interested, right, is be able to do things which I haven't done that much in my life, which is start having physical exhibitions and do installations and kind of and use projections and all these wonderful things, they actually do things in physical space. I'm not as motivated to do things in screen space because I've been doing it for 40 years already, right? Yeah, so yeah, so I get NFT, and if you want, you can publish my work on NFT and make money from it, that's fine. But to me, this is not so interesting. Yeah, you know, the physical space is interesting precisely because as our society is embracing the screen space of such a speed that it becomes no, it becomes very almost like oppressive, right? Uh, so, and also human interaction. That is the most important point when you have an exhibition. I mean, well, I would say, you know, in my experience, right, when you have physical exhibition, sometimes you have some dialogue, sometimes not. But typically, I manage to stimulate dialogue when I put things online, right? So because I've been curating people who follow me on Facebook, Instagram, etc. I mean, Instagram, it's kind of hard to get the dialogue. 
But I realized recently that lab, you know, it doesn't matter if you publish articles or, you know, or slides or artworks. You're most happy when you publish something on social media and there's a dialogue and people start talking. And, and as long as I can stimulate for dialogue or communication, that's what I'm happy, right? So from this point of view, it doesn't really matter. As far as physical exhibition, you know, I mean, I, I don't know, I've been part of 120 exhibitions, but most of the time I didn't go to them. Uh, and uh, I can't say, uh, but, you know, I kind of like I'm an expert in using Facebook. And for me, uh, at this moment, it, I may change uh, when I get lucky, but I have to write the post, right? And I have to make them provocative. And I have to post colorful images because people don't respond well to my melancholy black and white images, right? You know, but I'm very happy when I can provoke interesting conversations on social media, uh, you know, and if it can also happen in a gallery or some kind of nonprofit art space, I'm happy, but it kind of depends on, you know, curators and uh, et cetera. Right? This is not something I can control. Thank you. Now there is a question actually uh, from what your mark? One of your friends. Let me find it. Okay. Is that deleted? Let me see. Mm. I couldn't find it. So which okay. question? The last one or? So uh, you answered. Or? You answered them actually. Okay, uh, so uh, any more questions or comments? To Actually, uh, hi again, it's me. Sure, uh, sure. When you talked about uh, triggering a conversation uh, on social media is more interesting than publishing an article, I immediately thought of my unrestlessness about uh, academic life because I'm a like a fresh academician uh, and. Uh, it, it's too slow sometimes in responding wow. to the uh, Some, changes. You know, sometimes it's, a, it's sometimes, especially for this field, it's like softly put, right? It's like, it's painfully slow. <laughs> yeah, I, all these you know, publishing find, find, right? uh, yeah. procedures, you know, sometimes you don't find peer review people and it takes months and months for your research to end up uh, out there. And uh, the technology has already become obsolete or something. How how do you handle those uh, issues? Yeah. Because I have a hard time really inside so, of oh, yeah. so, so I can talk about my experience, right? Yeah. Thank I you. think I was kind of lucky to be in the right place in the right time. And I think precisely because my experience of growing up in the Soviet Union, maybe you heard about some of that, right? Like with the whole culture of people publishing things online. When me and other people from Russia saw internet, we're like, this is some of that, right? And if you think about which cultural heritage has been digitized the most, it's been Russia because people just digitized everything, right? Uh, so in my case, as I said, right, I was kind of lucky. Beginning of my academic career coincided with the web and just intuitively, right? Whatever I write, I put online. And then people would see my writing online and they say, can we put it in our journal? Can we put it in our book? So by the time university would review, right, my research to give me a promotional note, Everything I've written was not only online, but was in all these books. And uh, somehow I was managed, right, to do this for like 30 years. Uh, and, uh, but I think now it's more difficult because now so many people write about, you know, digital media, et cetera, right? That uh, uh, I kind of realized also that, you know, I don't think because my, my, my brain is like, became like, you know, stupid, but, you know, yeah, let's say, there are less, like people tra translate my articles in other languages less than before, just because it's all available. So I think intuitively I kind of moved to, well, I started to use more actively, right? Social media, because I already, as I said, have this following. And then uh, I like, right? It's like a sport. Let's say today I found out with Adobe uh, released this new AI tool. And, uh, you know, if I feel like it, I, I will write something about it. And I like being the first and then people pay attention, right? Of course, I also have to write something provocative. And again, I don't do it every time, but when I have something to say. So if you're writing about these particular developments, yeah, the publishing is very slow. Of course, if you're writing a book, which is now interpretation of, I don't know, some kind of medieval Byzantine art, when maybe, right, it's not changing so much and you're only interested in the opinion of 15 people, 
but um, what I want to say is, I said, for me, right, the key thing has always been, it's not about publishing or making art, it's about being part of a dialogue, right, and helping to stimulate it. And uh, that's why, I mean, that's why, right, that's why the internet was obvious to me, and I'm just so, so lucky. Uh, I have sent a couple of my very first articles uh, when I was like 31 uh, to journals, it was before over. And then in 2010, uh, when I had a lab, right, and I had some postdocs and graduate students, we also sent some articles to the journals, and I forgot how painful it is, right? You send the article, you wait like six months, and then you get this reviews and we misunderstand it. Uh, and I, guys, I have no idea how academics do it, right? You know, I thought academics have easy life, but now I kind of try to be one again, because I'm, for example, I want to publish article in the peer journal of my student. Oh my God, oh my God. Uh, I really don't. So guys, so I just, I just, I just took the easy road, okay? I mean, I, you know, like I do it because it's just easy. Uh, so I think that, um, but what I want to say, I think today it's still possible to put, to write something, to put it online in your website, your blog, et cetera. Say, well, this is a draft or submit you know, for peer review. And then you can wait till it comes out, right? So I published up in 180 articles. They've been reprinted like 700 times. In 30 years, only once, Somebody said, Lev, you know, you signed a contract for us, but you put this article online, can you take it off? But it was one time out of 700. You know, obvious academic publishers, they like, we don't, we don't go online. They're like too busy or we don't care, right? So I think you can still kind of do this double game. You can still do double agents, right? And uh, people, people said, Lev, but if you put stuff online, people are going to steal it. Well, first of all, GPT is going to steal it anyway. <laughs> And you know, Marshall McLuhan used to say, if you don't like these ideas, I have others, right? So of course, you know, so many times you see your ideas, because other people book an article and you're not quoted because you know, I probably do the same because which is how human mind works, right? But if you're productive like me, you know, uh, I don't mind people like copying me and not, I mean, quoting me. Uh, yeah, I would like to get like, I would love to get a dollar every time it happens, but, uh, uh, I kind of prefer to be right in the, you know in the avant-garde and prefer to be in this kind of forefront of these discussions, and uh, you know, um, and also chance people are going to copy my ideas. They're going to misunderstand them anyway, so it doesn't matter, right? I mean, don't, let's not take things so seriously. You know, it, it's like it's like a game anyway. You know, so so that's kind of my advice is that you know. That's a relief. Oh, Thank you so like, much. Yeah, be be a rebel, be a rebel. So so like, be like me, where like. I basically used I used the academic academic field as a kind of artist. I use it as a medium to get what I want from it, to get money, promotion, salary. <laughs> and then I kind of used our systems just to kind of talk to people. And uh, as I said, today it's just more difficult because there are so many conversations. But um, you know, not very few people I think post their actually ideas on Facebook. Most people complain about their cat, right? Got cold. And I think people read me because actually I still do something which is a bit unusual, right? And I don't know why, right? Because people are paranoid that somebody will steal your ideas. You'll be so lucky if somebody steals your ideas. Anyway, uh, I'm, you're younger, you may have different ideas. Maybe I'm completely out of it, but that's kind of my experience. And, you know, so, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Genjo Gulan, uh, he has a question to you. I if Lev was an uh, artificial intelligent chat boy, what kind of jokes would he make? Uh, okay. Well, um, yeah, so, you know, um, I actually haven't, I haven't tried uh, to use these tools, right, for jokes. Um, you know, I always admired, right, Slavoj Žižek, right, you maybe know him, who kind of used these political anecdotes, right, which were very popular in this kind of late, Social societies, and he always using them, right, to, to make his philosophy. Uh, I uh, I know, right? I, I remember lots of anecdotes from uh, my childhood. Some are political, some are like very sexual. So I, I can't use really them today. Uh, but but the more, more seriously, what I want to say, people, who, if you know about AI, right, you know that one of the most difficult thing to research was to actually get AI to understand humor, right? and to understand irony. And that's been like a huge body of research. So I don't know where it is. 
uh, I don't know the where it is at, but um, what kind of jokes, uh, what kind of jokes the AI lab will make? I mean, to me, more interesting question is, you know, we live in this time where like people became very cautious, as you know, right? Because you make a joke, and when people put something on Twitter, and when you're out of a joke. So I'm more interested, not whether these jokes will be good or not. I'm more interested is, can we, before I die, can I uh, leave, can I kind of uh, encounter a period which will be more like 60s and 70s, when I think people will be much more free and more experimental. And uh, now we have amazing technology, but uh, I think our cultural period, from my point of view, is not the most stimulating, uh, is not the most innovative. Uh, we have amazing technology, but maybe we lost spirit um, or soul. And again, I don't want to sound like old fart by saying it. Maybe simply I'm out of it. Uh, but I think we still can, I think our cultures, we still use the kind of baggage and vocabulary of modernism, right? We kind of still rely on what obvious amazing discoveries in 20th century art. Uh, where we're making some VR or XR installations, it doesn't change it. Uh, I'm also right quite concerned. It's kind of a recent turn in art where the content or who made something is more important than maybe it's good or not. I understand it's a kind of like a, maybe a good change, but I hope it's not the final result. Uh, and uh, I'm, as you see, becoming very, very conservative, right? And very, very anti-progressive. And maybe to be progressive uh, today, to be avant-garde is to be anti-modern. And uh, maybe that's who I am. I'm not sure. Yeah, so it doesn't matter if I tell you jokes or AI. What's important is that I will allow to tell jokes. I will allow to say things which people think insulted, right? Because when you start taking all the instances of violence, in, delete, in editing our historical culture, this to me is very scary, right? Because we're going to make with children in, right, who have this artificial idea that humans are wonderful, humans love each other, ta -ta -ta. and then we're going to go in the world and it turns out it's not always like this, right? The humans continue to hurt each other, uh, right? The position of woman became a bit better. It can go a long way. But, you know, the history of human race, I'm sorry, was a history of violence. And conquest and slavery, right? In, in Asia, in Asia, right? Not just in the West, right? But in Asia, Middle East, like right, one, you know, one group of people were enslaving another. And we can't simply just, I don't think it's I don't think it's a good idea just to simply forget about it and to find this from our children, right? So uh, I want to die in a society where it's okay to tell jokes and even to insult some people because otherwise we are we, we will become worse than AI. You know, it will become worse with AI. So, you know, okay, I think Gulan, Gulan is, I think, likes, right? Is okay? Yeah. So, thank you. Yeah. Now, Punar Yildizan would like to ask you a question. Uh, Punar? Sure. Yes. First, I would like to thank you for your uh, nice presentation. And uh, in my uh, thesis, uh, my subject is installation art and awareness in contemporary museums. According to that, I search for traces of the installation. My question is, new media art present people's lives as an installation in social media, social networks. What do you think about it? Um, so what do I think about, so I want to make sure I understood you correctly, right? So you're interested in installation, but uh, you also mentioned social media. So, yes, so, what, so what's the kind of what's the connection? Uh, for example, uh, if you look at the Herman Nish uh, art, uh, he's doing the blood rituals, uh, and when he's performing, the people are including. Like in also social media, uh, we are also the audience is including in the art. That's why I want to ask you. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, with new media, uh, art presents people's lives. So mm -hmm. uh, it's an installation. Okay. So what do you think about it? Well, um, so, you know, I'm, first of all, let me apologize. I'm not completely sure I understood you, but, but maybe that's okay sometimes to misunderstand. And maybe also I don't know this artworks you're referring to. But let me just say what comes to my mind, right? So uh, since my topic today is I'm conservative, 
uh, not conservative, but I just, you know, I don't think culture is a progress, right? So, uh, so to me, right, the great achievement of the 19th and 20th century art was starting to represent the human psychology, right? The nuances of human experience, you know, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, you know, Proust, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? And I think I always felt that, you know, the human psychology doesn't change. But our experiences do change. Our relationship to our past changes because of these technologies, right? For example, you know, now we have photography and now we have AI and this photography you know, existed already in Tolstoy time, but it was not so widespread, right? So media may change our relationship to technology, to our past. Media changes our relationship to each other, right? Selfies and so on, right? Uh, I can send, you know, I can send a message to a person I love and I want to remind you that the reason Anna Karenina built herself, right? It's very clear in Tolstoy Novo. You know, in, in, in, in that period, 19th century, in 18th century, people, like aristocratic people, they were writing notes to each other. And they had messengers, right? Who would actually carry them. So it was normal for, for example, Catherine the Great, right? The 18th century Russian, you know, uh, uh, right? Uh, the ruler, she would send like, dozens of messages to her kind of, uh, to the minister, her boyfriend every day. And the same thing was happening on the Karenina. And, you know, she was like feeling very, very distressed. And she sent messages to Vronsky. And Vronsky, of course, only cared about his horses. And then the message didn't arrive and she killed herself, right? I mean, I'm, I'm literate. <laughs> <laughs> so what I want to say is that I think as, uh, you know, our society changes, right? As we know more about the world and each other, global news, travel, I want to see uh, artists or creators make, imagine new ways to represent human psychology, human experience, etc. I mean, again, we had a great period, you know, from, uh, you know, Van Gogh, right? Or Tolstoy, up to, let's say, Godard, and etc. But I think in the last, you know, 40 period, the art became interested in ideas, concepts, political action, uh, media technologies, and the only place, right, where you see people representing humans is cinema, right, Netflix, TV, and books. But the techniques we use are not so different from 50 years ago, right? So I personally always was hoping that new media artists experimenting with new technologies and new ways of representation will also try to come up with new ways to represent uh, a human being, right? So for example, today, Right? I'm not limited by my memory. I'm not limited by my body. But I have these AI tools, which are extending me, right? I have Facebook, which is extending me, right? So uh, let's say the, the boundary between me and the world, right, is a bit different. So how do we represent it, right? How do we write a novel in the age of Facebook, right? How do we you know, write you know, a novel or a poem in the age of AI, right? Where AI has learned from human history. Right, so how do I represent my, you know, my sorrow, my melancholy, my joy, my suffering in a way which is different from Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, uh, you know, Proust, uh, I don't know, George O'Keefe. That's kind of what I like, right? I mean, if I can do some work in this direction before I die, I'll be so happy, right? Because, um, and also I'm a bit upset that only so-called commercial arts are doing it, right? Why artists have lost interest in the kind of human being or human psychology? I don't know, right? Maybe I'm just maybe I'm just stupid. Maybe I don't get it. Uh, but uh, maybe somebody can explain it to me. But to me, it's a mystery, and uh, you know, that's what I'm hoping to see. Uh, and maybe now with AI, is making us very embarrassed because AI can almost simulate us, right? Or AI can fool us. Right, I mean, AI who only learn associations between words can fool us into having meaning. Maybe somehow it will motivate us to, uh, if AI can already simulate talk, conversation, and speech, and, and, and you know, speech, you know, a kind of modernist writing, we have to do something else, right? And somebody is going to do it, or Hollywood will do it, right? Sorry for a long answer, but that's my answer, right? So I don't care about installation or drawing or whatever. It's about representing, uh, it's about this, the subject of art, which never changed, which was a human being, 
but every society, every period found new ways to do it, right? Between, let's say, you know, again, ancient cultures and Mesopotamia and Greece and Maya and Bruegel and Dürer and 20th century artists and today, and uh, I think today, this kind of traditional art exists, but we call it commercial art, whereas so-called high art is doing something else. Uh, and um, I think there's a certain lack, uh, which I feel. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Sula Turhangi will ask a question. Sure. Hello, Mr. Manorich. Hello, hello. Uh, um, I this year I just finished my uh, thesis uh, about uh, looking at our age as a global village and metaverse lives, and I used your publication, the language of new media, uh, inside it, uh, yeah. and uh, especially your thoughts about new media uh, and its effects to uh, real life. Uh, mm -hmm. affected me uh, especially and I want to learn um, after uh, you you were talking about the cinema and uh, in new media as new media computer but uh, we come to a new uh, level with metaverse NFT uh, and it's it's uh, getting started to um, change one more time uh, what do you think that will the effects of uh, these two things, maybe NFT and metaverse, especially yeah. when we when the thought of uh, metaverse, when you think sure. of uh, what will be, what can uh, change, uh, especially in sure. our lives, and especially uh, in the perspective of uh, art. Sure, sure. And, uh, as I listened to you, I was I was planning to uh, ask this question, but I was all prepared to be asking uh, this question to you as an academician. But mm -hmm. uh, as an academician, what will you answer to this question, and how mm -hmm. will you answer well, as an artist? Yeah. I want to learn. Sure, sure. Well, I think actually it's the same person, you know. Uh, so I'm sorry to say that my answers may disappoint you a little bit, but you know I, I kind of made my career by speaking what I think, and I never say what I'm supposed to say, and that also works. That's my brand, right? Okay. So NFT, uh, you know, I never thought it will have any effect. Uh, in 2021, people would approach me, "Can you write about NFT?" I said, "No, I don't want to waste my time." And I was right, right? It crashed, you know, because it was kind of idiotic idea, if you ask me, right? You know, uh, but of course, there's lots of interest because if people want to speculate, they want to invest money. Now it's coming back a little bit. So museums are still doing it. Uh, but uh, I really don't see any intellectual value in this. So I don't think it will. it's going to happen. I don't think it will have any effect. But other things will happen, right? Other things will happen. But by the time it happens, it will be different. You know, like uh, for decades, people wanted to have interactive cinema. It never happened. But when we got YouTube, right, where films are normal, but but we have access to follow the millions of films, right? So I don't think NFT in its current form is going to survive because like, it makes no sense uh, and it's not interesting. But something will happen in the future. As far as metaverse, to be honest, I kind of think the same, right? Because uh, you know, VR was invented. In 66, right? I first tried VR in 84, and I always felt skeptical about it uh, because I think that the history of human culture is about developing new technologies, which basically allow us to uh, bypass our limitation. So, for example, you invent language, and now you can talk about, now you're not tied up to here and now, right? You can talk about past, you can talk about future. You can say, okay, I'm looking at one person. I can say, well, 100 people yesterday, right? So the language which emerges around you know, 50, I don't know, 30, 200,000 years ago in the written language was already kind of virtualizing, right? Was allowed humans to kind of become more free as opposed to being tied up to here and now, right? Like some worms. And then let's say drawing, right? Allows us to represent things which don't exist. 
And then, uh, I think in human history, right, people made very small things, miniatures, people made very big things like pyramids, but more or less in all cultures, the main interface with representations was flat surface, right? Whether it was a page or like a book for the last 500 years or like a roll in ancient, in Asia and so on, right? Because it's not such a nice format and it's very flexible, right? I can put something here, I can put something here, I can erase it. Uh, we have a kind of virtual book page with Photoshop, but uh, you know it doesn't take over my body, right? So for a moment I put first we are you know, we are uh, display head. I said, why do I have to kind of give up my physicality and stumble and be in this world, uh, which tries to recreate physical world instead of trying to bypass it, right? Like for example, right, when you're in video game or when you're in metaverse, you kind of like, you walk, right? But you immediately get lost. Every time people invite me to show my work in metaverse, and when I go to this exhibition, I can't find the exhibition space, I get lost, right? Uh, so that's why the web is very successful, right? Because the web, it's another technology which allows you to become more free, right? I can be here and when I can jump and I can be here. So it's basically like billions of, right, pages. So in a way it takes the technology of page or surface and makes it stronger, right? So to me, this VR, yes, of course it's useful, you know, if you want to train somebody to operate some machine or maybe to discover molecules, but as a cultural, Technology. I never, never understood. I never, I never, I never liked it, and I still don't like it. Right? Uh, partly it has to do with realism, but I think also this idea of like putting right a display, maybe it is you know, paper display or something else. I mean, maybe one day the technology will evolve, but definitely not with generation. The generation is still very heavy. Uh, and do you actually want to spend eight hours inside the display? No. Now. Uh, the well, last thing I want to say is this, right? So metaverse, I think has no future. It's not going to happen. Something will happen one day, but it already happened. It's called World Wide Web, right? It's a collection of web pages connected by links. And it gives me something which is unique, but it doesn't imprison me, right? Because when I think about the web, right? It's like a virtual space. I can be here and I can jump here. But instead metaverse, I have to actually walk, right? And like, why I have to walk inside virtual space? Like, why you give me the same limitation as my body has, right? You know, so no, but it's like, it's like, it's like, so to me, it just, sorry, it just makes no sense. Now, of course, uh, you can still use the web, right? To make some theater plays or some performance, but maybe it's going to be interesting or not, right? If you're interesting artists, if you have great ideas, if you know about history of avant-garde theater, you make something interesting. Most artists do not. We, we, we're not educated, we don't know, we don't know about Peter Brook or Meyerhold or whatever, right? I mean, you could make something interesting and maybe it exists, I haven't seen it. But again, if you're an interesting creative person, you can make something interesting you know, from air. If you're not an interesting creative person, I can give you a supercomputer, you'll, you'll still do idiotic things, right? So technology by itself doesn't change anything. Technology has changed humanity, but it's not going to make, right? I mean, we remember Socrates and Plato. Plato didn't have even typewriter, but we remember because Plato, you know, uh, discovered some amazing ideas, you know, and, um, uh, you know, there was this research published recently that after a very dynamic period of scientific discovery, like 19th or 20th century, despite so many more scientists, so many more PhDs, so many computers, the rate of scientific discovery has slowed down and people do no longer make these fundamental discoveries. Why, right? So it just shows that the technology by itself doesn't change anything, right? Uh, although, uh, but as I said, you know, I think the more people know, the more we know cultural history, the more we know which have come before, the more we can travel into this amazing universe called human history where people had very different ideas, very different aesthetics, they thought about things differently, the more you have a chance to invent something new, right? If you only look at this new media art, you will basically, uh, by default, will basically do only idiotic things, right? Because, because you know, you because new media art doesn't have any, like, doesn't have much of its, like, yeah, it, it's about interactivity algorithms, but it needs to have some content. So when the architects do things with computers, it can be interesting because architecture has 2000 year history, right? So, you know, we need artists who, people who be educated in other things, 
And, uh, and we also need them, we need them to know about history of computer media. And we say, oh, this was already done in 1906. That's not interesting, right? Um, so we have to, we have to, I'm, I will tell you something so radical, I'm afraid. You know, after being with kind of new media, right? New media revolutionary, like Lenin, right? New media, let's go. I kind of want to almost be, we have to get rid of this new media, you know, fetish. Just because something is new doesn't mean it's better. Just because something is like made from metal, it doesn't matter it's good for wood, right? Only I think when we get rid of this fetish, when we have a chance for good new media art, you know? Uh, uh, so on the one hand, right, I'm still for it, but I kind of want to be, you know, a bit more realistic. And uh, I think that it's very important to educate students who can work across media so maybe I'm trying to do it myself, try to educate myself, uh, because ultimately, if you also know how to draw, maybe you can make more interesting things in VR, not necessarily draw, but maybe if you know about sociology or you know about, I don't know, early medieval poetry, but if you only know what we are, you're just going to repeat what's around you, right? Anyway, like it was like, I'm not like addressing you like I'm addressing everybody, right? But the point is, you know, I, I kind of want to question this idea. Okay, with this new thing, how is it going to change art? This new thing is that you want it's not going to change art. Why, why can't I say that, right? I think, for example, you know, if you ask me, what is the big new technology of synth for art in the century? Spatial audio, you know? What I mean by spatial audio is not just like this, but when you have multiple, right? Multiple sources of sound, you can compose and sound sources can move in three-dimensional space. That's amazing. Uh, it hasn't been explored that much yet. It can be, you know. So there are some amazing things, but not every new thing is amazing, you know. So, uh, sorry for. I hope I didn't. I, I mean, if you get depressed, then call me, and I will. I will be like. I will be like new media therapist, and you know. You know uh, <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, there's also uh, another. Um, question from Petya Shaklova okay. and uh, she's asking <clears throat> about uh, her profile preserving presenting new media art and um, yes then asking oh yeah yeah yeah sure sure okay and how about let's make it uh let's maybe we can make it oh such nice questions uh, okay how about I do this one maybe one more uh, and and this will be the and, last uh, question. No, no, I, no I, I can go on, but I want, I want to try, I want to try the new Adobe tool before I go to sleep. I'm curious. <laughs> anyway, okay. uh, thank you so much. Yeah. So I think this idea of preserving your own archive, right? It's very interesting. Well, so um, in my case, right? I'm, I, sometimes I was very clever. Right? So when I kind of put start start putting everything online, it automatically gets archived in a way. In the same time, right, it's tricky because you can go to the library and there are books from 200 years ago and you can get them. But as you know, I don't know what percentage of internet is kind of broken or abandoned, but I think huge proportion of websites, they no longer load, right? Flash animation doesn't work, links are broken. So if you go to Internet Archive, right, which is the most amazing project to archive the web, uh, yeah. Some sites work, some sites don't work, so it's very uneven. So uh, as I'm getting a bit older, right, I started to think more about it. For example, in Korea, the famous artists who also get lots of money, they all build museums for themselves. So in Korea, it's very common for like super successful artists to make their own museums. So that's one way to do it. But if your museum is very far in the middle of nowhere, only local school children are going to come. So that's not so interesting. So what I did, uh, what I did last year, is I started to do a new kind of archive of my writing. Maybe some of you have seen it. Uh, so I basically have like have like an assistant who is also my Russian student, paying her, and with her help, uh, I found out original word files of uh, all my articles, starting like my first one ninety one. And so far I got to 2007 and then we'll continue. So I tried to find originals like on my old drives uh, because the versions which I have on my website, which is also archived, we're not always like maybe, I'm not sure we're the best ones. So we found these articles 
And then uh, uh, she, what she would do is when she would go from a text, she would get rid of all the word formatting because who knows how long Microsoft is going to exist. And then we put all these articles together, right, into a single file. So if you go to my website, the first thing you're going to see is this file. So it's basically one file, which is available as PDF in HTML. And uh, it's basically a text file, it's ASCII, with very minimal markup. You know, markup is, you know, you do like a, you know, asterisk, bold, right? So it's basically the most universal, uh, very simple uh, formatting, but it's all in ASCII. So it took us like eight months and we did this. So now you can have access to all my published writings uh, during the first part of my career. It's 63 articles. And uh, it's, in fact, it's going to live like forever, right? Because I think ASCII text is as universal and as long-term archiving format as anything, right? And you can visualize it, et cetera. So now I have to find energy to do it for the second part of my career. And I spend lots of time thinking about the format, right? So you can kind of think of it uh, as a digital humanities project. Uh, but the reason I did this not only to archive myself, but to turn my articles into like a, into a data set, right? Because what I learned from doing cultural analytics for 15 years is once you bring a body of cultural artifacts together and you make it into a structured data set that you can analyze patterns, right? You can do statistics, you can visualize it. So I'm hoping maybe in the future people do the same, right? And also, you know, so for example, but also if you want to assign something from me, you don't have to go to my website. Like people keep mentioning my website, books and articles, but you guys are kind of be behind the times because I already published this archive like in November, right? Uh, uh, so uh, you can say to the students, okay, here's left file. You can read pages 33, 134, et cetera. And when the student gets interested, she can say, well, let me search this file to see where else Lev is talking about computer graphics or metaverse, et cetera, right? So it's a very simple thing, but I haven't seen any other academic do it. And I can give this also as a template, right? Um, um, so that's what I did for text. With images, um, so I kind of have to make a website, right? Uh, but uh, it's a bit more tricky. I think JPEG is a good format, right? Even though it's compressed. But of course, web technology is changing. Uh, Right, most of the websites from the 90s, if you try to open them, some work, some don't work, right? Uh, so, but also guys, let me finish by saying something very dark. You know, one day I'm going to be gone. So now you can find my articles on memwitch.net. You can find my things on academia.edu, but I'm paying for memwitch.net, right? So who's going to pay for this when I, when I go away? And it may sound a bit crazy if you're 25 years old, but uh, you know, like, like who is going to care, right? So I kind of have to, you know, so I think Facebook now is preserving all the pages of dead people, but uh, my, you know, so like I think manage.net is a great archive already, right? It has all the steps, including my book, but who is going to maintain it? I don't know, right? So the technical issue is not the issue, but who's going to pay like $7 a year? I don't know, right? Uh, so maybe I have to make a language foundation. <laughs> anyway, okay, okay, Petya. So thank you for the answer. And for the next time, I will also ask about the artworks and collection, how you artworks, <laughs> yeah. archive this. Well, you know, I just want to, say, as you know yourself, right? Because archiving immediate art is a very big issue. It first started to be discussed already in late 90s. And uh, you know, archiving cinema is already big problems, right? Because films disappear. But of new media art, you know, it's one of the tragedies of my life because sometimes I think I should have just been a poet or, you know, make some watercolors, right? Because what remains from the 90s, my book you can read, but you can't see any artworks, right? <laughs> so my book, which talks about the spirit, you know, is still useful, but there are very few artworks which survive. And the artworks, if you actually have them today, they will be meaningful, except, right, all these installations which use silicon graphics, Etc. Right? None of it available, and you know you maybe have some bad video, and I think one of the reasons, as you know, right, mini media art is not as as popular in our society as painting or sculpture because it's not well documented, right? So I think one of the reasons I'm also now trying like drawing, like this is going to like archive itself, right? 
somebody can open my drawings if okay if somebody wants you know after I die and say here's the drawings but you know with JPEGs uh, and it's a very strange issue right because there's internet so there should be a place where you can just put like 10 megabytes of images and to stay forever right but but what's but where it is I don't know right it's kind of weird right because all websites we have to play pay providers and then Facebook of course they're trying their best but ultimately you know we're not in the business of archiving humanity like you know it's a good thing that we're trying right uh so uh and the internet archive is now in court uh because we're being sued by some book publishers so maybe we'll be forced to take the archive out so we build the internet we build social media but we, we haven't actually built very simple archiving function which is so that's more important than obviously NFT crap, right? Why don't you guys focus on this, right? And like do something, you know? Uh, because that actually will be very useful for all the all the new media uh, patriarchs like me, you know, who are thinking about this, you know? Sorry to be a bit morbid, you know, but, but it's also for young people. You know? mm -hmm. so. So, okay. okay, one one last one, yeah, last one. I think it's all. Uh done now you have done uh, a great I exhausted activity. i exhausted you i exhausted you you are exhausted i thank you very no, I'm not, much no i'm you know, guys i need a great lecture i you know i'm a kind of animal you know like some animals we need we eat grass right like cows i eat i i live in conversation right in fact you know this is like this is the time when i'm alive right and i can go for like hours and hours i may feel tired later but who cares right uh, but I'm hoping that, you know, um, I haven't been in Turkey that often. Last time I was in Istanbul was maybe six, seven years ago. And, you know, um, I know that Turkey is not just Istanbul. Don't worry. But mm -hmm. I hope one day some of us will meet in person. I love your energy. And, uh, yeah, my... and uh, you know, um, uh, we'll meet up. And I guess the advice I want to give you, look around you and think about it. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, if everybody says A is great, it's probably not. So we only, the, the strategy which I can recommend, which works for me, if everybody explores A, says maybe I should look at B. Doesn't mean you know, it's always going to work, but at least you'll try something different, right? And um, it's not being difficult for the sake of difficult, it's just that if everybody already talking about A, and you could talk about A, you know, you're going to be behind by default, right? So if everybody already wrote about X and V, and you're going to write about it, right? Like nobody wants to write now a dissertation about what Benjamin, right? Because it's like, what else could you say? Um, so uh, in my case, as I said, I like easy. So in writing about new media, which is always changing, yeah, sometimes I feel big regret that I wrote about all these artworks which no longer exist. But at the same time, I kind of played a certain role in this process, right? And, uh, you know, which is also important. Uh, so if everybody excited about NFT, when maybe it's the last thing you want to write about, you want to write about something else. Uh, so being in media is mean, is, you know, I think also means it should simply be open, right? That's what we learned about. I mean, that's why I joined the computer revolution 40 years ago, because I realized that Art is controlled by rich people and by you know by prestige, etc. But computer is such a force in our society, right? It's like this great wave, and nobody owns it. Companies don't own it, museums don't own it, academics don't own it, and it's always changing, and sometimes it's frustrating because the past is forgotten, but at the same time, it's like a great surfing experience, right? If you ever tried surfing, even if you even if you only stand for one second. It's it's really like amazing experience. You kind of feel drunk with excitement. So that's why you know I think you know for many years, as opposed to being artist, which would be easy, I chose this hard part of like surfing the age of computer revolution because I like this idea that nobody can control it, and uh, and I think that's a good thing. So thank you so much. Thank you, Bilur, thank and you. Uh, thank you everybody. And um, until you know, until uh, you know. Okay. To see you in person. I will, I will meet you. I will meet you. I will meet you on the beach. I'll meet you on the beach. <laughs> yeah, yes. get, get, your, get your surfboards. Get your surfboards ready. So, get yes. your surf. That would and, be great, actually. Thank you, Lev. Take care. Hoşça kalın. Harika bir sohbet oldu.
Aslında güzel bir e, öğleden sonra sohbeti oldu. E, sona kadar kalanlara da teşekkür ediyorum. E, görüşmek üzere. Salı günü yine çok değerli bir konuğum olacak. E, onun e, duyurusunu da yapacağım. Deprem bölgesiyle ilgili fotoğraflar. E, Murat Germen gelecek. Herkese iyi bir öğleden sonra diliyorum. Hoşçakalınız.